Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Philip Cherny. I'm the Flowmon Product Marketing uh, Manager. Forgot to change the title. And welcome to today's webinar, Hacking in 2024, and what to watch out for. Together here with me is Brian Seely. Welcome, Brian. Hey. Uh, Brian is the ethical hacker, cybersecurity expert, and a former U.S. Marine. Uh, Brian became became one of the most famous hackers in 2014 when he became the only person to ever wired up the United States Secret Service and FBI. Shockingly, he told the two agencies before he was caught and instead of being sent to maximum prison security, uh, maximum security prison, the Secret Service called him a hero and praised his courage and integrity. So Brian, that must have been a crazy story. Uh, can you tell us how it started? What made you do it? Poor choices, my friend, poor choices. Um, there's the long story and the short story are much different. I was trying to show a systemic problem at Google, Yelp, anything online directories. And, and this was specifically in the, in the United States, but it's not a US problem. It's a global problem. Mm -hmm. People have found a way to manipulate search results on like, Google Maps. So anything that shows like a 10 ranking with phone numbers and business names, if it's the yellow pages or whatever book that you had and you actually had to call places, all mm -hmm. of that's in print. So it's all alphabetical. So you have no yeah. idea who's close, who's far, who's good, who's bad. Everyone's just alphabetically listed. Well, now it's dynamic and it's sorting based on reviews and proximity and um, all sorts of different things. So mm -hmm. if you can game that system, if you can manipulate it to get all the results to be you and all the phone numbers forward to my cell phone, I'm gonna get all the phone calls. Oh, I can then do that work or I can sell those phone calls to other people. And we, a lot of people call it lead gen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of unethical lead gen. <laughs> this is one of those sources and it's common in locksmithing, landscaping, pool cleaning, anything that a contractor goes to a business or goes to a client's house uh, or location. You wouldn't go to your pool cleaner's office. Why? That doesn't make any sense. They probably don't have an office. So if you can put 50 locations all across the country, you're going to get a lot more business than just one. So people did this over and over and over again. And I wanted to show Google, hey, this is how they're doing it. And they said, we we don't care. It's spam. It's not a security issue. There's it's just spam. You're not going to do anything with just spam. So yeah. I don't know what it was, but that bothered me. Mm -hmm. And it was this. It was at that point I should have went, hmm, I should come up with a good plan. But instead, I made a whole bunch of funny business listings that I mm -hmm. thought would maybe get some attention. Um, I made Edward Snowden's secret hiding place in the White House lawn <laughs> in Washington, D.C. I renamed the Scientology church, the head church in like L.A., the Mormon temple, the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, I might have changed the Russian embassy to a gay bar in London. <laughs> I, I have no plans to visit Russia anytime soon. <laughs> Not but, after this. <laughs> no. Wait, is something going on? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, I mean, we're in America. We don't know anything. So mm -hmm. the idea is I wanted to draw attention in a positive way. That didn't really work. So instead of something funny, I thought, well, what if I could do something serious? And I should have thought this part out better. Mm -hmm. But I created a, a fake Secret Service location in D.C. in the same location as the real one. Mm -hmm. And it just looked like a duplicate, but the phone right. numbers were different. Now, if you if you're familiar with online marketing, as you are, you can get phone numbers all over the world to forward to other phone numbers and you use them in marketing to track which ad is doing what much better than another, which TV yeah. spot or which print ad or whatever. So that phone number would ring to the Secret Service. You wouldn't even notice. It's just a smooth forward. But I could record the call for quality purposes. Uh -huh. they, yeah, that was the, that's the, Probably that's the part area, right there. Right? 
<laughs> yeah. The FBI in San Francisco, too. So as soon as calls started coming in, I, re I kind of realized I needed to call somebody. And so I called a few friends. They told me to go uh, to the Secret Service office in Seattle. So I did the next day. And then they didn't believe me right away. It was like 15 or 20 minutes of going over what I just told you. And they were just rolling their eyes and like, all right, well, we'll, uh, we'll call you if we- They, they if, let you, you know, go we, home. They were gonna let me go home, yeah. Wow. But like, like I said before, poor choices. So <laughs> I decided, I was like, okay, this is serious enough that I was able to intercept calls to the Secret Service. The right thing to do is to show them and not worry so much about my own safety because mm -hmm. I'm already here. You know, like we've already made all the trip and um, so I said, okay, look, I can prove it in less than five minutes. In five minutes, I can't prove it, I'll leave. Mm -hmm. Pull your cell phone out. So he grabs his cell phone out of his suit pocket. And there's three agents and me, and we're in like dive like a square, a small little lobby, five meters by five meters, and a couple chairs, nothing big. And the agent pulls the cell phone out and he taps on it a few times and I said, call the the Secret Service office in DC. Hello? Yeah, this is, yeah, no, 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 I'm just checking on something. Yeah, thanks, man. We're just following up. I just wanted to make sure the phone was working. Click. Hangs up. My phone got a notification. You got a new phone call. Would you like to listen to it? To your campaign Secret Service? Well, yes, I would. And I pushed play, and then I pushed speakerphone, and then I played back. What we all now heard was ringing, and the guy on the other end said, Secret Service. And it was like so cool, like deep voice. And then we heard the whole conversation. And the other two agents and I actually got to hear the other guy. And then them. And mm -hmm. that's when they they took all my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and how, did, they, how did you feel at that moment? Like you must have been scared. You should ask the agent. He was the one with the gloves. <laughs> Hands oh. on the wall, patting. Check all your stuff. Here's a form that says, do you understand your rights? Please come back to the guest suite. We'd like mm -hmm. to ask you some questions for four hours. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, well I got well, out. I, I was let I was let go because there was no criminal intent. I didn't try to like sell it to some foreign government. I tried to do the right thing, even when they told me to leave, mm -hmm. even though that would have been smart. And yeah. they let me go. Ah. That's good. That that's I think how it should so, turn. So so far, yes, it's been hugely positive. <laughs> so that kind of let's say skyrocket your cybersecurity slash ethical hacker life. How how did that go? Where did you turn up now? What do you do? That that definitely got what I guess you'd call it street credibility. So it was enough that made people curious to want to hear the story, and it turns out. I mean, I'm I'm not the best hacker in the room. I'm not the most capable programmer or best at networking, but I do enjoy talking and meeting people, networking in real life. So I grew up traveling my whole life. I like doing public speaking. I don't get nervous getting on stage or doing webinars. It just doesn't bother me. And mm -hmm. being able to like talk about computer security in a way that makes people understand just a little bit more is worth the effort, whether it's mm -hmm. relating to a funny story or finding something in the news and breaking it down a little simpler, because I have to explain it to my kids. So why not be able to explain it to everybody in a way that doesn't sound like I'm trying to be the smartest guy they've ever heard of? Because yeah. that no one likes that guy. Yeah, that's true. And you know the rule, like if you can't oh, explain yes. it to uh, a year old, then <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> right. Right. And they will mercilessly tell you what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, well, okay. Well, to be completely honest, I got so excited to talk to you that I forgot to tell our audience uh, some of the housekeeping rules. So please allow me. Uh, for our audience, um, 
you have your webinar panel on the right side, most likely, with the questions available uh, with the questions panel. So if you have any questions throughout the webinars, please write them down. We'll have time at the end of the webinar to answer some of them. Uh, for those we won't have time to go over, uh, Brian offered that uh, whoever will reach out to him on LinkedIn, he will respond to you in person, uh, personally via LinkedIn as well. So uh, that's for the questions. This webinar will be recorded. You will receive the recording in the email a couple of days after this webinar ends. And that's it. And with that in mind, we can uh, move on to our, uh, to our topic of our today's webinars, which is the hacking in 2024 and what to watch out for. So Brian, easy questions. How easy it is to get hacked in 2024? What do you think? Oh. We're raising the bar in a lot of ways, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. Um, to give you an example of a, a crime that's progressed in the United States, our southern border is Mexico. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, there's been a lot of types of scams related to someone calling uh, a loved one, like a grandparent and saying, we have, we have your son. He was caught drinking in Mexico and he got arrested for peeing on a police officer's horse. I don't know, whatever. And we're going to turn him over to the federales because they, you know, they're coming to get him. But if you send us $1,000 by a Western Union, we'll forget the whole thing happened. We'll drop him off in El Paso or wherever. So these people are freaking out. They said, don't call the police. And if you can either A, sound like you're speaking english roughly as a second language it's more believable i can't do it or if i can it's kind of inappropriate to fake the accent but the idea being i wouldn't pass as a mexican police officer so if mm -hmm. you can sound like a mexican police officer or you are one or close to it that's more believable so now suddenly western union is sending money all over the southern border for scams and it's very difficult to recover the money mm -hmm different security rules, different legalities. It's not like they're going to go after somebody and extradite somebody for 500 bucks when they've got way bigger problems south of the border. There's drugs right. and guns and crime and gangs, and it's a nightmare. So that we thought was sort of the end of that, but it looks like with the AI voice generated boom and everything, we're getting kidnapping phone calls where the voice of the actual kid they're alleging was kidnapped is being used help mom <laughs> like it's believable yeah and it's ruining these parents who then find out their kid wasn't even kidnapped right like how, how pissed at your kid would you be for a second you're like you're not even <laughs> yeah i will kidnap yeah. you uh the idea being that voice trust that society thinks if they that that is unfakeable mm -hmm. it's going to be exploited until everyone's just used to it and going yeah no i don't believe you sorry and i yeah. think the the one thing that's going to have to get better soon is the phone systems in all over the world mm -hmm. somehow switching to a blacklist versus whitelist yeah or yeah. the other way around so you're specifically allowing certain people access or being able to call you and if someone wants to i don't know call you for a sales pitch or a, a bill collector they have to go through some sort of gatekeeper authentication mm -hmm. process certification process yeah. because otherwise we get missed call we get calls with no caller id i can spoof your cell phone mm -hmm. and call your mom from your cell phone number or what it looks like on caller ID and she'll think it's you. And if I have the voice AI capabilities, which yeah. I do, I can make you say anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, the voice even changes a little bit throughout the phone. So if the message is panicky enough, you know, no one's gonna pay right. attention. Reception, done. I'm going yeah. through, I'm going through a top, uh, 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 yeah. uh, like it's just endless so, ways of being able to lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So uh, that's uh, definitely one way that's going to be improved and AI plays a huge role in that. Uh, what what are the other thing in the let's say the cybersecurity landscape that you think organizations and people should watch out for? I think a lot of the scams have migrated from targeting individuals because a lot of people for the last maybe 10 or 15 years think their home computer is constantly under attack. Mm. So much. You don't have anything really valuable there. Nothing more valuable really than what you have online in these different websites. So like yeah. you participate in Facebook or Google or iCloud or any of these massive sites mm -hmm. or any of the top 20 or 30,000 even, those are big collections of a lot of worthwhile data, credit card numbers. It's mm -hmm. much better for them to break in there than it is to break into everyone's house. Right. It's just the yeah. effort involved and to then get nothing is just silly. Not a lot of people store all that information on their home computer, but it's definitely stored at corporate in databases and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's my people are getting more organized on the criminal front. We know this because it's like old bank robbery movies where you've got mm -hmm. a driver, you've got a gun specialist, you've got a safe cracker, you've got the handsome guy, you know, <laughs> like who's always with the ladies. But like you've got all these different roles and everyone's coming together to be a team. Well, you've got experts in remote desktop, mm -hmm. zero day vulnerabilities. You've got iPhone guys, you've got Citrix and all of these different specialties teaming up and working together. And then you've got a guy who just puts the malware into a foreign system. And the guy mm -hmm. who wrote it is licensing that software so that you can then spread it and then you share in the profits. And there's yeah. a whole business model around this and it's ransomware as a service. It's, I mean, smart. They're organizing. They're not going after individuals. That doesn't make enough money. They're going after your stuff where it's all with everyone else's. That's mm -hmm. what works for them. So yeah. defending yourself has become harder because you've basically made a photocopy of your wallet, all your credit cards, all your identification, passport, social security, whatever, and you put it in a whole bunch of other places that you have no control over, <laughs> and you're hoping they do a good job. So pick one of your friends, and every one of you and all of your friends take your wallet and you give it to that friend, and then you have him walk downtown at yeah. night. Good luck. If he gets robbed, all of you guys get robbed. So that's kind of the concept. Yeah. We're not seeing individuals being relentlessly targeted unless you're a celebrity a politician that kind of thing so companies have a lot more to lose and they have a lot more catching up to do the bar has to be raised because they're breaking mm -hmm. in fairly often into big companies and the small companies don't have the budget they don't you need more security people mm -hmm. and all the tools that you can possibly find and test to do what you're looking for and make sure that you have as much visibility as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. So you, you mentioned ransomware and, you know, ransomware attacks have become more sophisticated. In your opinion, how has ransomware evolved and what defensive strategies should organizations adopt to mitigate the impact of these attacks? It's, there's a lot of different varieties now. So they're, they're modifying their code using AI or other just clever programming so that the signature of the file that's being transferred is wrapped in something, in some encryption that's never been seen before because it changes every single time. Otherwise it's going to get caught by all the other antivirus scanners and everything else. So if they can't see what's inside the box, you deliver it. And then if it doesn't do anything right away, people get a false sense of security. So sleeper ransomware, if you want to call it that. Some people mm -hmm. do. Um, it stays dormant, doesn't do anything. All the code is jumbled, it's obfuscated, and it's really difficult to ascertain what it's doing. And there's, it takes really smart people uh, quite a bit of time to undo the damage or even decrypt or come up with some sort of decryption key. But 
before that happens. If these guys are committed billion dollars or more in damage, and there's hundreds of new strains coming out every year, massive organizations with salespeople. One of them was actually broken into, was it Revel or Evil? Uh, mm -hmm. They're very original with their groups, but one of them was hacked. They had a Slack channel <laughs> in the ransomware company yeah. and they had payroll and mm -hmm. sales guys and IT guys and support tickets. I think they had Jira. Like that makes me feel bad for them. Yeah. Like we have they, Jira they, too. Like they work like a legitimate business. So right. yeah, and well, except that's being like, what's gonna. But that's the. You can't just have one guy doing everything. He's not going to be an expert in encryption okay. and code and modification and obfuscation. There's so many different specialties. You just can't do it. You might be able to build a little engine inside of your garage, but you're not building a nuclear reactor. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's that level of scale. So we're seeing much more sophisticated attacks. It's going to be difficult to evade. Anyone who thinks it's an if that you're going to get hacked is being unrealistic. It's when. It's when. So yeah. What happens next? They've 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 breached one thing. They've gotten in to a server or in DMZ or an employee's laptop. Now what? Mm -hmm. And the yeah. next step is usually almost always lateral movement of some sort mm -hmm. escalation of privileges doing more reconnaissance figuring out hey where can i go exactly this mm -hmm. is it mac is it windows is it linux what are we doing and then mm -hmm. they wait and they gather information and if it looks like it's a big deal they get more people it's mm -hmm. a whole thing and there's a process for it it's all documented and it's mm -hmm. complicated as hell because there's so many variations and so many different possibilities. But if mm -hmm. you can find that anomaly in the jumping around or in the when they land, so endpoint detection and response, you can mm -hmm. uh, with a seam or something like that, you can find, hey, this login was we we use like one company that I worked at a couple years ago. We spent a very large amount of time taking the local admin off of Windows stations and then putting a, dif a different account on that looked like a domain admin. Mm -hmm. Somebody logged into it, it was a canary in a coal mine for us. So we knew that somebody had uh, dumped LSAS with Mimi Cats or something like that. They were mm -hmm. able to get a tool on there that we didn't allow that specifically for getting passwords uh of cash credentials and we made it look like we made a mistake so that they could then ha but really it was it was a warning bell for us mm -hmm. and then we were able to shut everything down but there's mm -hmm. so many times companies don't have that kind of visibility yeah just like this yeah, yeah i just um, wanted to sort of follow up yeah this is the SOC visibility triad introduced by gartner i believe in 2015 maybe and yeah, if you, you mentioned CM and EDR, and that is actually the third pillar, the network detection and response, which is what we as Progress do and provide to our customers. And the idea is that basically each of these pillars basically makes up, the, or the other two makes up for the, for the one's shortcomings. So having these three technologies basically should help you stay protected and have that. If, if, you're, trying, if you're trying to catch criminals in your city, and you have you have one area of town that has a building that's got lots of criminals. It's like Judge Dredd. It's a giant building full of criminals. And then you have another one over here, another one over here. Wouldn't it be easier if you were able to look for criminals who are going in between the buildings? Like, I don't know, on the roads, like in cars. That's yeah. what network monitoring or that level of, you don't want just looking in the buildings and doing, hey, looking in a window or trying to get a warrant, that kind of thing it's it's different locations you're either at rest or moving and those are two completely different technologies that need appropriate monitoring and if you can't tell me some very specific information like who are the top 10 downloaders in your company because more than likely one of those 10 or more is uh bringing something in they shouldn't or uploading something somewhere that they shouldn't be yeah Exactly. 
and the added value is that now you can apply those because we know what the normal behavior in the network operations looks like we know how a typical user behaves by you know going to your email clients and the emails going to some sh share points and that stuff but if you're going something malicious that's abnormal behavior that we can we can basically detect on so right that's if, definitely if my like, facebook messenger is on at four in the morning and i'm with my ex-girlfriend she's going to be like why are you up at 4 a.m who are you talking to what's going on this is yeah. not this is not okay you, you've got work at seven in the morning like she's a detective and it would immediately result in a red flag mm -hmm. but if you're not paying attention to any of that you could just get away with it yeah yeah exactly. what you want to know like office 365 for example provides a lot of those new features where you're able to then hey are you in uganda because five mm -hmm. minutes ago you were in new york <clears throat> yeah something's not right are you using a vpn or did you go in some other way it at least lets you know that this this is starting to look shady mm -hmm. we're going to ask for more information yeah yeah exactly so um I'm going to follow up to the second questions and we, we a little bit touched on it in the beginning. So what role uh, do you think the AI will play in the future as well in the on the attacking side from the hackers point of view as well as in the on the defensive side in cybersecurity? One thing that gave me a lot of I guess not encouragement but it was having AI compartmentalized into little bots or some sort of function uh, like a nurse. Mm -hmm. So it it would either start with a different data set, large language model that's specifically related to nursing, maybe some people skills. Uh, you know, in that context, it knows exactly what it's doing. But if you ask it about politics, it'd be like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it can actually talk about mental health or, you know, comfort and things like that. Yeah. Something that can do tech support that isn't going to make racist jokes is kind of important because mm -hmm. people people are trying to you gotta love them some people are really trying hard to break stuff that people are implementing without really knowing how it's going there's a there's a handful of people posting about trying there's a car dealership that had chat gpt as their you know like a chatbot like We've now brought in ChatGPT, and immediately people started trying to break it and make it mm -hmm. do stuff and get around uh, ChatGPT for OpenAI restrictions, like how many messages you can use in one hour. So they're just going through the dealership to do the same thing and using up credits that they've end up paying for the API access. Like mm -hmm. that's hysterical to me, and it's it's open and crowdsourced product testing functionality testing, pen testing, and a little bit of humor mixed in. So yeah, maybe they were out a few dollars or probably more for all of these requests, but they learned something and so did OpenAI. And I think it's, I don't know where this is gonna go exactly, but people are very excited. Some people are very worried. I think there's enough eyeballs on it that we stand a chance of making it go some places that'll do a lot of good. I know for a fact, I was on a panel um, two or three months ago and a woman from Uruguay was back in the US. She was just visiting her sister who was mm -hmm. diagnosed with cancer. Well, the doctors back home didn't anticipate diagnosing for six to nine months usually but because of ChatGPT's analysis of just some very basic information and some symptoms, and then treatment recommendations, she was able to like give this entire packet to her sister and then talk to the doctors and do some translating. And they were able to get her in in like two months, found she had cancer, started treating early and she's in complete remission. Mm -hmm. Huge, oh my God, like what a cool story. But then there's horrible stories. So like it's, just like everything else there's good people and there's bad people so let's uh yeah. got to pay attention and try to do the right thing and see if we can anticipate thinking how they're going to think and, and mm -hmm. fix it yeah maybe no wiretapping but something <laughs> yeah well 
that is a different angles on on your story but i think you it's a good the outcome was good at least you know it's i would rather be lucky than good <laughs> yeah okay so another question uh impact of remote work on cybersecurity. with the rise of the remote work there was a shift in how we operate most of the people now work from home myself included uh how do you think this trend impacted cyber cybersecurity at what recommendations do you have for individuals and organizations to secure their network it definitely accelerated something that i don't think we would have ever, i don't think we would have gotten to the fully remote concept for a long time a because property owners and leasing companies are losing a fortune and that's, they're like, we need people to come back or we're all out of money. And they're like, all right, we'll try, but they're already home in their pajamas. They all bought like Lululemon stuff. They're all happy. <laughs> and it's true, like, I don't wanna go back to commuting. No, I, I, I will leave, sorry. But that added new challenges. So now this company border structure and the edge, it's gone, it's all gone. Like you log into corporate resources on multiple devices you're on your phone so now there's companies kind of vetting out bring your own device mobile policies laptop policies ipads androids all of yeah. them have different specifications and capabilities they all have different standards and there's cis benchmarks and dod stick file there's all these different things and recommendations and like what makes you most secure but the most secure ones is like this is for sure good it just says unplug it <laughs> that's it like take it off the internet and you might be okay <laughs> everything else has some inherent risk to it so making sure people understand how important good password usage and policy is you don't have to change it every 30 days if it's really long and hard to guess it doesn't have to be hard to remember hard to guess so you could have like uh, my dog is a terrible driver <laughs> and then just a random number and a symbol and an uppercase letter and whatever. Or you could have yeah. the first line of a favorite song, your mm -hmm. entire street address from when you were a kid all in one line, no spaces, <laughs> no have nothing. I mean, yeah. that's something easy to remember for you and nobody's guessing that. Yeah. As long as it's more than 14 or 15 characters right now until we get uh, the quantum nightmare shows up. <laughs> And then yeah. all of us lose sleep uh, <laughs> when Bitcoin just turns to nothing and all the internet websites are no longer secure. We yeah. like, can't wait for that to happen. Yeah. Um, until uh, then, 14 or 15 digits mathematically is not going to be broken unless you make it easy for them and you start reusing things. So not only are websites breached and the credentials are sold on the dark web or collected. They're also organized to a fashion of say, oh, if they see the same email address in mm -hmm. one breach and then six months later they see it again, they'll make a note. And if your password changed in any sort of a pattern, like April two, three, dollar, dollar, with a capital mm -hmm. A, and then it's June, dollar, dollar, like, okay. oh, this idiot uses months. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have guessed that. They can then build that into a guessing program to take a <laughs> lot of the uh, certainty or the uncertainty out of it. So now 15 characters doesn't matter if you gave them half of them. That's how the Germans lost World War II and the Enigma machine was broken with Heil Hitler. Like yeah. knowing one thing for sure eliminates just the right amount of a variable to solve the rest of the equation. So mm -hmm. if you give them anything predictable or anything that they're gonna go, hmm, I think I know what he's gonna do, you're it, that's it. Yeah. That keeps them out of all of the other accounts, especially when people reuse passwords because it is hard to guess or come up with new passwords all the time, unless yeah. you're using like a password manager. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What, are, what is your point of view on password manager? Uh, I use one. That's good. Um, it used to be LastPass. 
they are definitely uh, trying to salvage. Uh, or they had a bunch of breaches fairly recently and didn't. I don't feel like they handled it in a way that made me feel super great about it. But uh, every company is entitled to make a mistake and attempt to continue to do business to do their thing. I wish them the best of luck. I will be somewhere else. Uh, password managers are great when it's very hard to remember a lot of them. And then you can use your iPhone or Android or tablet or desktop or whatever and have access to all of them or share them with family members. So it's like, hey, dad, what's the password for Spotify? And then you just share the password in a secure way so they have access to it and they can get permission to go into the repository. But just that little bit of time educating your kid or showing them how to deal with that. Some people are just like, I'll just text it to them. Yeah. That um, is better than emailing the username and password. If you send them separately over different mediums, that's way better than just one. However, yeah. not the most secure practice ever. Yeah. Absolutely. Agree. Yeah. I am actually getting ready to do a commercial for a identity theft service, let's call it that. And we're going to spoof the host's voice and call his wife and get her social for an insurance form using a simulated voice. Mm -hmm. We're just plain old social engineering and phishing. I mean, the amount of things you can do with just a quick phone call and a believable story, it's mm -hmm. insane. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, let me move on. Um, so, Let's look at the attacker's point of view. So how difficult it is for a hacker to stay unnoticed once they get past the perimeter, let's say. Once you get into the organization's environment, how difficult do you think, or you can tell me how difficult it is to stay unnoticed within the organizations when either they have or they do not have, let's say, the network validation and response solutions that Flowmon provides. I haven't thoroughly vetted Flowmon. Mm -hmm. Sounds like I need a license key. Maybe. <laughs> no, the idea being it if you are if you don't move, you'd be like me in high school, completely unnoticed. Now, <laughs> no, just with girls. So if you aren't making any noise, you're not attempting to do anything, use credentials, you're not scanning things, there's um for people who don't know, there's scanning software that's fairly common in the industry standard would be Nmap. And mm -hmm. there's about a million different variations of scans with all the different variables. And you can do, uh, they literally, there's Christmas tree scan. Like it sounds made up, no, but it's real. There's ping scans, <laughs> there's TCP half open, TCP full. There's all these different things that you're trying to get information from target systems with yeah. or without notifying the target system that you're asking for that information. If mm -hmm. someone, let's say, wrote Nmap, maybe they'd be able to look at Wireshark raw captures and go, that looks like someone's doing a stealth this with this sort of parameter, but it would mm -hmm. take a savant. You'd have to be looking directly at it. And even then most people wouldn't see it because there's so much network chatter Mm -hmm. and errors being sent and be like connection timed out retrying connection timed out retrying dns failed dns lookup failed it's always dns but uh, even though everything's configured properly something bounced off another who knows there's a million and one reasons why there's a million errors it's so, impossible for a human to connect all the dots right yes even if someone would be able to comprehend them <laughs> yes it's a it would take way more time than we have so that's where AI will be critical, is ingesting really large amounts of data. Um, I was impressed within the first week of when everything kind of went public. I was like, I want a summary of this book and pasted it into this special Excel doc that someone had put together. And holy cow, it broke it down chapter by chapter and then paragraph by paragraph and like spidered it all out. And it's like, wow, that's, it's incredible. Now mm -hmm. I want to see it translated into another language and then back and then see what happens after a while. But it's, a, it's amazing how much data it can actually look through that it's never seen before 
mm -hmm. and come to a like a conclusion that actually is actionable and matters. We can't do that yet. That's where people with AI tools who know how to use them are going to beat out people who don't. Mm -hmm. Anyone trying to do things manually the old-fashioned way isn't even playing before AI that we're still using programs or unethical hackers aren't doing all this stuff copy and paste. They're not getting through a million credentials by copy paste. They, mm -hmm. they have stuff doing that for them so they can go play World of Warcraft or something. They're yeah. they're lazy. Those, those guys are the best programmers. They're not trying to waste time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely agree. So, um, so from organizations' point of view, how difficult it is for organizations to uncover hidden threats in 2024 and stay protected from your experience? Let's give you this scenario. 15 person architectural firm, Los Angeles, New York, Milan, wherever. Um, second floor of a building, commercial building, everything's wired internet. Every building was built 10 years ago. You contact your ISP, we're setting up an office, you network 10 computers together, you have a few offices, conference room, you get a firewall from whatever, like Best Buy equivalent, something, a thousand, you spend a thousand euro. That's not small. And then you pay for the subscription service and you have an IT guy that you've always had and he sets everything up. That's that's about the bare minimum. You're you win no, I mean, you just, you don't know what you don't know. That mm -hmm. is, if you're an architect, you made a model of a one bedroom cardboard box. Like that's the minimum product that actually works. There's so much left to do to get to a point where, if I walked into that office and they have Office 365 computers, and they all have Office 365 installed. They've got maybe Windows Defender. I will never find the hacker with just mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. If if he's even awake or paying attention, <laughs> there's no forensics tools. It, it's hopeless. Absolutely hopeless. You're trying to find a hacker like a robber, but you have no security cameras. Yeah. Like you're trying to listen or like hope, like maybe I believe. How do you protect something you don't see, right? It's impossible to achieve security without visibility. Yeah. So it's, if you don't have the tools for the thing you're like, you might have the fastest police car in the world, but it, it isn't a boat. You can't, you can't. You can try, yeah. it won't work. It's not gonna catch anything over there. You have to have the right tools for the right job or for the right medium or for the way that they're trying to attack you. You can't defend against, oh, oh crap, we didn't think about planes, they've got planes. You know what I mean? That's. Yeah, you're right. So uh, I'm now, we're sort of getting close to our time. So I'm gonna move to the questions we received from the audience. And uh, I wish I could have seen the time when the question was asked so I could tie it. To I can do this one really quick. 2FA tokens are the, like a, like a YubiKey. Those are the only things as far as two-factor authentication, reliable, commercially available that we know hasn't been hacked or broken yet. I did an interview with Kevin Mitnick a year ago. We did a webinar and we were talking about different ways of bypassing. People can bypass 2FA, uh, session hijacking, token steals, different things like that. If you have a 2FA YubiKey or something like that, a USB stick that you actually have to physically hold and present and type in a pin, Mm -hmm. that's that's about as good as you can get and it's very reliable it's very easy to remember it's much better than a long password and typing it in all the time i use one for two different companies and they're bulletproof mm -hmm. they're not that hard to set up either and they're cheap mm -hmm. okay good 
So there is the uh, one question. So is this particular method of shifting calls and recording them still common today? Did anyone in ch uh, in charge learn from this other than the hackers? I guess that's. Uh, Did anyone word. in charge learn anything? <laughs> <laughs> Adorable. Um, I don't think that's possible, but uh, Google shut down new map registrations for probably a month or two and then they turned it back on and said they fixed it they didn't i gave a ted talk a year later and made a new location in the white house it was called it was a snowboarding shop called edwards snow den two words yeah and <laughs> and it's 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 one of the dumbest jokes i've ever made but i'm so so very happy about it and it was to show that it's still possible then since then it's gotten harder but there's still other technicalities or ways around it that don't involve google mm -hmm. uh, depending on which country you live in mail forwarding and things like that so you can there's always ways to game the system and the only way that it'll ever be as close to truth as possible is when business registrations on private websites are actually checking with whoever the source of truth is and who gets to say a business is a business? Probably the, com the the municipality or city or country that determines, did you pay for a business license? Are you a legal business? And yeah. if you are, you can go be on Google Maps. But that's not how it works yet because no one wants to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So until then, they're gonna people are going to try to rip you off every possible way. And then again. Yeah. Do you think you'd be able to still do that? Still hack Google Maps and put Edward Snowden secret hideout on the White House? I I have I am told that I'm supposed to say no. <laughs> That's but, yeah, I'm pretty. It, it, I was very 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 clearly told all my nine lives are gone, and I'm not allowed to ever wiretap anything. So mm -hmm. I have not. However. <laughs> Should the situation have come up where I was given uh, permission? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't do the same thing twice though. That's a little hacky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, another question is, uh, what about uh, security in mobile devices, iOS, Android, in enterprise in enterprise in 2024? Devices store more sensitive more sensitive information, bank contact. Uh, enterprise access to FA token credit cards. Is this the one questions you covered before? No. No. Uh, so if you have um, if you have iOS by nature, it's probably more secure than Android. Looking back a few years, they've caught up. Depends on how your settings are. If you allow access to third party app stores that are not the default Google Play or iOS app store. Um, to put it in perspective, if you want to go to a like an arms dealer, essentially it's people who sell exploits for software to get mm -hmm. a zero day for an iPhone that allows you to, without prompt, or without user interaction, meaning you don't have to make a mistake at all. And I can send a code to your phone like via text message or something, and it makes gives me full access. That's like five million dollars. Jesus. Even just a simple zero day is like a million. That's a really high entry point. So for the next, hopefully someone sees this, the hundred people who are going to call me in the next year asking me to hack into their wife's phone or their husband's phone or somebody's phone because they saw me on the news. No, they didn't. <laughs> They're not spying on you. Your boss isn't hacking your iPhone. There's nothing weird going on with that. Probably. However, mm -hmm. the one in a thousand that I have seen. That guy was being followed and it was a whole different problem because mm -hmm. if there's a nation state after you yeah so let's say if you're a law-abiding citizen you you don't have to worry about that <laughs> yes no mas uh no hablo inglés so yeah we're uh yeah that's not my i'm not touching that <laughs> whatever you did buddy you got to live with it um android is it is it any less secure these days there i mean it's google makes good products so does microsoft you don't see them in the news often because of that when you do see them in the news it's because they made something not 
we lost all your stuff sorry yeah it's in their best interest not to lose it because they're too busy selling it mm -hmm. absolutely all right well uh i guess we're coming to an end uh brian if there would if there can be one thing that you could leave us with uh, one thing for us to remember what would it be for anyone who thinks that like they don't understand this stuff so it's scary or like i don't i don't get it or like this is just it's all moving so fast it's moving fast for all of us and all of us had to learn to tie our shoes all of us not a single person alive invented tying shoes we all learned from some other guy so you just because you read a book first doesn't mean you're way more awesome than everyone else they're doing something else so like ask questions it, don't care about looking stupid don't care about like, i should know this i look stupid all the time like i have kids they never let you know what my daughter told her cousin she's like yeah my dad used to be really cool he's got tattoos he's big he looks scary but he's just a big goofy dork like this is my kids like 15 year old it's like oh <laughs> so honest i'm so proud <laughs> like, the, everything is moving a mile a minute it is impossible to keep up especially yeah. if you're pretending like you know what's going on that's mm -hmm. the quickest way to like oh yeah no i totally took care of that problem and then now you can't get help because you already lied like it happens at every job inevitably somebody doesn't want to look like they don't know what they're doing well mm -hmm. how are you supposed to have five years experience that software just came out yeah yeah that's true okay okay brian thank you very much uh this has been a great inter interview we don't have any more questions so maybe with the ending i just would like to say uh being able to detect and uh, respond to you know hidden threats within the organizations is something that we as a we at progress with flowmon solution provide so if you would like to try our solution please contact us we'll be more than happy to tell you more about it and until then i'm going to be looking forward for, for the next webinar so brian again thank you very much and thank hopefully I'll see you next time thank you everybody